There's nothing more exhilarating than pointing out the shortcomings of others, is there? This video is made possible due to those who support me on Patreon, whose names you will see credited at the end of the video. And I'd like to give a big shout out to patrons Sophie Black and Conrad Truitt. Thank you all for your support. took your first pinch like a man, and you learned the two greatest things in life. Never ride on your friends, and always keep your mouth shut. Anytime you're feeling lonely. Though he may not be the first name that comes to mind when discussing the most influential figures in the cinematic world, Ilya Kazan, whether you have heard his name before or not, could arguably be said to have had more of an impact on American cinema of the last half century than any other individual. Not only due to the influence of his own filmography, which includes some of the most acclaimed and groundbreaking films of all time, but as co-founder of the Actors Studio, one of the nation's most prolific drama workshops, he had a hand in the popularization of what is known as method acting, a psychological approach to acting that was later brought to mainstream prominence by actors such as Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, and Dustin Hoffman throughout the 1970s, all of whom were students of Lee Strasberg, referred to as the father of American method acting, who took over as artistic director of the studio in 1951. Said approach would go on to change the face of American cinema over the next several decades, and inspire some of the most acclaimed performers of our generation. Kazan's contributions to the medium have been praised by other acclaimed directors, with Nicholas Ray calling him the best actor's director the United States has ever produced, and Stanley Kubrick stating, Kazan was without question the best American director. But perhaps Elia's most notable and vocal admirer is director Martin Scorsese, who in 2010 made the documentary film A Letter to Elia, where he speaks of Kazan's influence on his own career and cinema as a whole. And thus, you can imagine it must have been quite the honor for Scorsese when he, along with Robert De Niro, was given the chance to present Kazan with an honorary Lifetime Achievement Oscar at the 71st Academy Awards in 1999. But as you will see, not everyone was as enthusiastic about Kazan being honored. Chair Mademoiselle, you have chosen the wrong because Ilya Kazan is a traitor. For them to be again insulted by a man who had, who had just destroyed their lives, their livelihoods, so on and so forth, and for the Academy now to give him an honorary Oscar, I thought was, was totally despicable. This guy is a serial betrayer. Yeah. He is a disgrace to the human kind. The billion people are going to know that there are people in Los Angeles who will not be silent. You can't separate his art from his life, and you can't separate his life from the lives he ruined. I am sure those of you who have never heard the name Elia Kazan are quite confused as to what this is all about. So for the sake of clarity, I'd say it's best if we start at the beginning. The son of Greek immigrants, Ilya moved to America at the age of eight. Upon reaching adulthood, Ilya set out to pursue a career in acting and would later find what he would call the greatest thing that would ever happen to him in his professional life, the group theater. Formed in New York City 1931 by Cheryl Crawford, Harold Clerman, and Lee Strasberg, which would be the precursor and inspiration for the actor's studio. The group consisted of writers, directors, actors, all of whom came together in a collaborative effort to hone their artistic aspirations, 
producing works that dealt with timely and controversial social and political issues. It was here that co-founder Lee Strasberg would develop what is known as The Method, the framework that would fundamentally change the landscape of American acting over the next near century. Despite being told by both Strasberg and Clerman that his acting chops were nothing special, Kazan became one of the most notable actors of the theater. But it was his turn as a director that would cement him as the towering figure he is considered today. Kazan directed a number of highly acclaimed stage productions while still with the group theater, and after its disbandment in 1941. He made his feature film debut in 1945 with an adaptation of Betty Smith's A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, aka that book we all read in grade school at one point or another, and would go on to win Best Director at the 20th Academy Awards for 1947's Gentleman's Agreement. That same year, Kazan would form the Actor Studio with Cheryl Crawford, co-founder of the group theater, and director Robert Lewis. And in 1949, Kazan would direct the original Pulitzer Prize winning Broadway production of Death of a Salesman, penned by legendary playwright Arthur Miller, a close friend and collaborator of Kazan's. By the late 1940s, it was safe to say Kazan had established himself as an essential figure in both the theater and film industries. But it was only a few years later when he would change the course of cinema forever. You must be Stanley. I'm Blanche. Oh, you're still sister. Yes. Oh, hi. Yeah, hey, where's the little woman? In 1951, A Streetcar Named Desire was released by Warner Brothers Studios, directed by Kazan and starring Vivian Leigh, Marlon Brando, Kim Hunter, and Carl Malden. Based on the Pulitzer Prize winning play by the great Tennessee Williams, the film was widely acclaimed, going on to win a record three acting nominations for Leigh, Hunter, and Malden. Ironically, the film would have swept the acting categories, but Brando was not awarded Best Actor, despite the film being his breakout performance. Kazan had produced a stage version of the play in 1946, starring both Brando and Malden, but it was the film adaptation that served as a sledgehammer to the current state of American cinema. The film was noted for its commitment to realism and fearless exploration of taboo and controversial topics, introducing a psychological and sexual intensity to the screen that perhaps had never been seen before. The film could also be said to be a watershed moment in terms of the shift from the more traditional theatrical style of acting present in the early days of cinema and the method-based approach that would be embraced raced in the decades to come, a dichotomy blatantly demonstrated in the first scene between Brando and Leigh. It was at this moment, the introduction of Stanley Kowalski, that broke the floodgates of what was thought possible, and also made every straight dude question their sexuality. Kazan would go on to direct other acclaimed films, notably On the Waterfront and East of Eden, each catapulting their leading men, Marlon Brando and James Dean respectively, into legendary status overnight, cementing his impact on the world of cinema. Kazan's profile as a director only grew after the release of Streetcar in 1951, but it was what occurred in 1952 that would be forever considered Kazan's most career-defining event. But in order to give context, we need to back up a bit. Uh, Mr. Bieberman, are you a member of the Screenwriters Guild, or have you ever been a member of the Screenwriters Guild? Now, Mr. Stribling, I would like to reply to this very quietly, Mr. Chairman also. If I will not be interrupted, I will attempt to give you a full answer to this question. It has become very clear to me that the real purpose of this investigation... That is no... 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 Ask him the next question. Ask him the next question. Are you a member of the Communist Party or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? Are you a member of the Communist Party? Are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? In 1938, the United States House of Representatives formed HUAC, the House on American Activities Committee, to conduct investigations on those with alleged sympathies to fascist and or communist ideologies. Following World War II, fearing that the advent of mass media entertainment could be used to spread anti-American sentiment, HUAC set its crosshairs on Hollywood, which led to the creation of what is commonly referred referred to as the blacklist. In short, if an industry member had ties to any pro-communist organizations, had merely expressed pro-communist sentiments, or even if they were merely whispers that they did, regardless of the veracity of said claims, that individual could find themselves completely barred from working in the industry in any way, shape, or form, effectively destroying their career in the blink of an eye. Even if there was no suspicion of an individual having any communist ties,
eyes, simply refusing to appear before HUAC at all would more than likely result in that individual finding themselves blacklisted. In 1952, Kazan was called upon HUAC in regard to his affiliation with the U.S. Communist Party, which he was a member of for only 18 months in the mid-1930s, over a decade prior to his subpoena. Though he originally refused to name names in his first testimony to HUAC, which was held in private, author Martin Gottfried revealed in an interview in 2004 that someone from the committee, despite the committee itself having no plans to hold Kazan in contempt of court, leaked Kazan's private testimony to the press. Um, but ironically enough, it was an informer from the committee who told one, some newspaper in Los Angeles that Kazan had not named anyone and had refused to. And that was when Spiros Gorris, the head of 20th Century Fox, said, you better name names or else you're never going to work in Hollywood again. His career at risk? Ultimately, Kazan gave to the committee the names of eight fellow members of the Communist Party, all former colleagues of his at the group theater. Actors and spouses, Phoebe Brand and Morris Karnofsky. Actor Tony Kraber, actor Ted Wellman, actor Louis Leverett, who had starred in Kazan's Gentleman's Agreement, playwright Clifford Ordetz, who had made a deal with Kazan that they would name each other in their testimonies, and gave to the committee the names of the same individuals Kazan did, but unlike Kazan, suffered irreparable damage to his career. Actress Paula Strasberg, the wife of Lee Strasberg, whom Kazan had stated was like a father to him during his group theater days, and actor J. Edward Bromberg, who had been blacklisted the year before Kazan's testimony after refusing to cooperate with the committee, resulting in him suffering from a tremendous amount of turmoil, which may have contributed to his fatal heart attack in December of 1951. Following his testimony, Kazan took out a full page ad in the New York Times to deliver a statement in regard to the rationalization behind his decision, namely his extreme distaste for communist ideology. And throughout his life, he was consistent in regard to its morality. Do you regret the decision now that you did that? Uh, no, I don't. I'm the opposite. I, uh, since everything that's been revealed since then, I feel that anyone who's gone through Czechoslovakia, Hungary, the Nazi Soviet pack, and all the rest of it, who still goes on that way, uh, uh, shouldn't shouldn't have sympathy. I think they should be brought up as I was to confront their past and say what they really think. Whether Kazan thought he was truly making a moral decision, or whether he just wanted to save his own career, it should be noted that Kazan stated the names he gave had already been given to the committee by others, although this has been disputed. Whatever the case, it was inconsequential to his industry colleagues, many of whom immediately cut ties with Kazan, branding him a traitor. However, the most devastating blow, what truly earned Kazan the scorn and disdain of his former friends and peers, would occur two years later upon the release of what is arguably Kazan's magnum opus. They thought they was going to beat an education out of me, but I fought them. Maybe they just didn't know how to handle you. How would you have done it? With a little more patience and kindness. That's what makes people mean and difficult. People don't care enough about them. Upon its release in 1954, On the Waterfront was deemed an instant classic and went on to win eight Academy Awards, including Best Picture, Brando's first win for Best Actor, his performance being hailed as one of the most legendary and influential in American cinematic history, and Kazan's second win for Best Director. For those of you who may have seen the film without knowing of Kazan's HUAC testimony, I am sure you may be cringing as this illumination now puts the context under which On the Waterfront was made in a far more insidious light. For those of you who are not familiar, the film tells the story of dock worker Terry Malloy, who after witnessing the retaliation murder of a fellow dock worker who was going to testify against corrupt union boss Johnny Friendly, eventually decides to testify against Friendly, ceasing his mob-controlled influence over the dock workers' union. Though Terry is initially shunned by his peers, the infamous final scene features him confronting Friendly, passionately declaring he is proud of his testimony, which in turn leads to the other workers supporting Terry. So, yeah, it wasn't exactly subtle that the film seemed to be a direct response to those who criticized Kazan after his HUAC testimony. In the film, Terry's testimony is framed as a heroic and courageous act, and it is those who shunned him that ultimately must learn the error of their ways. Despite the film's wide acclaim, it only intensified the bitterness of those who had disavowed Kazan. Arthur Miller, who had cut ties with Kazan following the HUAC testimony, had actually written the early drafts of the script 
script that would go on to become On the Waterfront before their falling out, and was appalled upon seeing how Kazan morphed his story into what seemed like an attack on those who turned their backs on him, Miller included. So much so, that Miller wrote the stage play A View from the Bridge, as a retort to On the Waterfront, in which the informer of the story is framed as a villain. He even sent Kazan a copy of the script as a bit of an extra go fuck yourself. Two years later, Miller was called to testify in front of Huack himself, but refused to name a single name, and as a result, was found guilty of contempt, though the charge was later overturned, and was blacklisted. Following the release of On the Waterfront, Kazan continued to build his filmography, including directing 1955's East of Eden, the screen debut of the late James Dean, and 1961's Splendor in the Grass. However, his testimony continued to be a shadow he could not escape from even after the unofficial lifting of the blacklist in 1960. During the production of Splendor, it is said that actor Warren Beatty, upon becoming frustrated with Kazan and wanting to antagonize him, asked him why he named all those names, to which Kazan responded by pulling Beatty into a room and berating him for several hours. And then there was the incident in 1982 where Orson Welles lambasted Kazan during an interview in Paris. He is a man who sold to McCarthy, all of his companions. He then made a film called On the Waterfront, which was a celebration of the informer. No question which uses him as an example can be answered by me. Though Kazan stated he felt no remorse over his decision, he has acknowledged the dark times that followed as a result of losing the friendship and admiration of many of his colleagues. Though Kazan did make some of the most notable films of his career post-testimony, note that despite him making 14 films in the 15 years between his debut in 1945 to the lifting of the blacklist in 1960, he would go on to make only five films in the next 15 years. His final film, The Last Tycoon, starring Robert De Niro and Jack Nicholson, being released in 1976. Whether or not this was as a result of of his contentious reputation in the industry cannot be said. Despite it taking place nearly five decades after his testimony, and over 20 years after his retirement, the announcement that Kazan would be receiving an honorary Oscar at the 1999 Academy Awards sparked controversy and protest, and his acceptance of the award marked his final major public appearance before his passing in 2003. So, what are we left with? I'm enjoying the McCarthy era. In 1952, you were called to testify before right. the uh, House uh, Committee of American Un American Activities. Mm. And you actually testified against a lot of people that you'd worked with, and named right. a lot of names. What, what did you hope to gain by that? Gain nothing, and just the truth. The only thing I had to gain was the feeling that I was doing the right thing. I didn't have a damn thing to gain about it. It meant a lot to me to to say that... Uh, but a lot of people didn't do that, did they? They would have protected people that they'd known. Well, they can do it. They can, they'd do what they thought was right. I did what I thought was right. And why did you choose that time when you were in fact called to testify to speak out? I mean, if you felt as you did, why didn't you say something before? A while back, I posted a poll asking my community for their opinions in regard to the death of the author. The origin of the concept was established in a 1967 essay by French literary critic Roland Barthes, who criticized the practice of incorporating the views and or background of the author of a particular work when interpreting said work. The idea is that whatever an artist meant to imply with a particular piece is completely irrelevant and their interpretation of their own work is no more or less valid than anyone else's. However, over time, the term has sort of been co-opted and been used to refer to the discussion in relation to how we as the public reconcile with the fact that the art we love and admire may have been created by morally reprehensible individuals. Can we separate a piece of art from the artist? The consensus of the community was that most felt the same way that I do, which is that an artist's work can be separated from who they are as a person. Now, that is not to speak to one's emotional reaction to a particular piece of art due to the actions of the artist. This will vary from person to person. Personally, the knowledge of an artist being a subpart individual doesn't seem to affect my emotional reaction to their art, outside of cringing a little every time I see the Weinstein Company logo pop up before a film. But it seems that most would agree that, say, stating a film is immaculately directed is not an endorsement of the director's character. However, things get complicated when we discuss the other elements surrounding this topic. 
topic, particularly when the artist is still alive and working to this day. Despite its horrid subject matter, I can say Birth of a Nation is a revolutionary technical achievement without worrying if I am raising the profile of director D.W. Griffith, as he has been dead for over 70 years. But what about a director who was still alive and working? Perhaps I can praise a film they make without praising them directly, but does buying a ticket or renting the film on a streaming service fall into a gray area, as I am to some extent supporting them monetarily? What about popular actors who work with a controversial director? Should we criticize them for doing so? But then again, films are made by many people. Is it reasonable to hold PAs accountable if they agree to work on the film? If we don't financially support the film, are we hurting the careers of all the other artists involved with its production? Does the severity of the director's transgressions play a role? What if they are simply accusations as opposed to proven facts? And then of course, things become even more serpentine when it comes to the accolades. Goes for Roman Polanski, for the pianist. In 2002, the Academy Awards award Best Director to Roman Polanski, who, in 1978, fled U.S. jurisdiction after being convicted of unlawful sexual intercourse with a minor, which is a somewhat less horrific sounding way to say he drugged and raped a 13-year-old girl. Multiple other sexual assault allegations have come out in the years since he fled to Europe. So what are we to make of this particular case? Is the award meant to celebrate Polanski as a person, or simply his directing? Should the Academy have given him the award regardless of the film's merits? Was simply nominating him at all paramount to condoning his horrible acts? Should Adrian Brody not have won Best Actor or even been nominated for his role in the film? Was him taking the role, if not an endorsement of, akin to overlooking Polanski's actions? Were those in the audience who applauded celebrating Polanski as a person or simply showing respect for the artistry? Is there a way to do one without simultaneously doing the other? I don't think I know what the right and or wrong answer is, I don't know if there is a right and or wrong answer, and I don't know if right and wrong even factors into it at all. And that is mainly why I think conversations in regard to this topic end up becoming so tumultuous, as there are so many nuances and asterisks that kick the legs out from under any conclusion one may come to. This video essay is actually a revival of a project I originally conceived back during my freshman year of college. After learning of Kazan's HUAC testimony, I was fascinated by the the story, originally seeing Kazan as a tragic figure who was torn between loyalty to his friends and patriotic duty. But almost a decade later, upon doing more research, my initial impression of Kazan as a tortured character was squandered by discovering that, well, to be frank, Kazan was most likely just a raging egomaniac. His statement in the New York Times reframing the main conflict of On the Waterfront, berating Warren Beatty on the set of Splendor in the Grass, though I originally romanticized these acts as those of a man struggling with the guilt of betraying his former colleagues, in retrospect, the more plausible explanation is that he had not a shred of remorse for what he did, not because he believed he had made the morally correct decision, but because he just didn't care and was only concerned with protecting his own career. There were other bits of information I came across during my research, many found in the selected letters of Elia Kazan, a collection of letters Kazan wrote throughout his life and his autobiography that only bolstered this theory. A sexual assault allegation, extramarital affairs, an array of regressive and misogynistic comments, an air of rampant narcissism. Earlier, I featured a clip of an interview from 1978 in which Kazan speaks of how he found comfort in the fact that, while he lost a number of friends following his testimony, he found solace in the friendships of those who supported and stood by him. You did in fact lose a lot of friends through that and you were blacklisted for a time. Did it make it more difficult for you to work in Hollywood after that? It did because I had a certain notoriety. It did make it more difficult for me to work. But uh, I don't mind losing friends if it's in a good cause. And uh, I also gained a lot of friends. So a lot of people admired what I did. Well, about that. For the 30 years w after he decided to retire from sh the film business, he wrote a, a memoir. And in that memoir, he told of how he had had adulterous affairs with the wives of all the men who had supported him for 30 years. Wow. 
However, despite who Kazan was as a person, regardless of what was truly in his heart that day in 1952, and whether or not he felt even a sliver of guilt about it, does any of that matter? When he was awarded his Lifetime Achievement Oscar, some stood and clapped, some remained seated and were silent. I wonder, what is it that each of these individuals was thinking in the moment? What was the rationalization behind their decision? I will stand and applaud the man for his artistry, despite his character. I refuse to honor a man who betrayed his friends, regardless of his prolific body of work. Were those who stood and applauded, in a sense, trivializing the lives and careers Kazan ruined all those years ago? Were those who refused to clap, disrespecting Kazan's impact on the world of cinema? Among those who stood and applauded Kazan, was none other than Warren Beatty. George Stevens Jr., founder of the American Film Institute, speculated as to why Beatty, despite his contentious encounter with Kazan while making Splendor in the Grass, decided to applaud. I believe we were both standing for the same reason. Out of regard for the creativity, the stamina, and the many fierce battles and lonely nights that had gone into the man's 20 motion pictures. Ironically, the Institute ended up voting against honoring Kazan with their own Lifetime Achievement Award. Though not all members were on board with this decision, said one executive, it doesn't matter whether Kazan ratted on his friends, just as it doesn't matter whether Orson Welles and John Huston treated their wives badly, or Alfred Hitchcock was a misogynist, or David Lean was not a terribly nice man. It doesn't matter finally. All that matters is the movies. You're honoring a person's body of work. Conversely, in 1997, after the Los Angeles Film Critics Association decided to not award Kazan their Career Achievement Award, the New York Times released an article accusing the association, ironically, of blacklisting Kazan. In response, VP of the association, Joseph McBride, sent a letter to the editor, which was, also ironically, exactly what Kazan did back in 1952, same publication and all, where he retorted, your contention that the political dimensions of an artist's life and work should be considered irrelevant to such honors is naive at best and dangerous at worst. It would compound and perpetuate the moral wrongs of the blacklist era for film critics to honor a career built upon the ruination of other people's careers. Personally, I can't say I completely agree or disagree with either statement. This discussion, one that isn't restricted to American cinema, Roman Polanski pour Jacques. A controversial win for the Franco-Polish filmmaker. Actresses stormed out of the theatre. With the face of France's Me Too movement, Adèle Enel mouthing the word shame as she exited. One that isn't restricted to film, one that isn't even restricted to the arts, will continue to generate contention. Contention which has been seen to have the capability of causing division among friends and colleagues. Among those who remained seated during Kazan's acceptance of his honorary Oscar was actor Nick Nolte, who stayed doing so cost him his working relationship with Martin Scorsese, who took offense to Nolte's refusal to honor honor his idol. In my video discussing male body transformations, I alluded to concepts such as parasocial relationships and celebrity worship. When I discussed how when we as an audience, due to our emotional attachment to and perception of an actor, celebrity, or athlete, regardless of whether or not we have even met them, are faced with information that conflicts with that perception, we may ignore it, if not react with hostility. In the case of Scorsese, with his frustration with Nolte driven solely by what he perceived as disrespect for the craft and Kazan's body of work? Or was it also, at least in part, due to the emotional significance of Kazan's films on his own career? I also want to thank Marty. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Hiding behind me? Come on. Right behind me. Where's Marty? Right here. Thank you. Thank you. and said frustration was caused by Kazan's sordid past being brought to the forefront. Ironically, as you may have noted from the opening of this video, Scorsese's own Goodfellas tells the true story of mob informant Henry Hill, who testifies against his associates in the film's finale. And, unlike in On the Waterfront, rather than being framed as an act of courage, it is framed as one of self-preservation. Looking back, I wonder if my own initial romanticized view of the circumstances surrounding Kazan's testimony 
testimony was as a result of not only my desire to derive a compelling narrative out of the tale, but my admiration for Kazan's films, particularly Streetcar, which was a film that knocked me out of my noob phase when I was in my teens, and exposed me to films of the golden age of American cinema. But today, as perhaps a demonstration of Occam's Razor, I must say it is far more likely that the most simple and disheartening explanation is the correct one, that Kazan made his choice to protect his own career regardless of how many others it destroyed and didn't feel a shred of remorse for doing so. Despite my view of who Kazan was having changed quite a bit since I originally conceived this project, I can't ultimately say whether or not the Academy honoring him was the right decision, nor can I make a judgment as to who among the audience that night made the right call. Is honoring his filmography paramount to reducing the severity of his actions and setting a precedent that an artist's character shouldn't matter? Does refusing to honor his work imply that one's art should not be separated from who they are and the quality of their character should always be a factor in how we perceive said art? In that same 1978 interview I mentioned earlier, Kazan was asked why he decided to testify before the committee. Whether or not his rationalization for making the decision was genuine, I found one of Kazan's quotes from said interview to be applicable to my conundrum. Why did you choose that time when you were in fact called to testify to speak out? I mean, if you felt as you did, why didn't you say something before? You were in fact kicked out of the Communist Party. I mean, were you in a way trying to get back at them? Not at all, no, because uh, not until I was actually in the position of making a choice, which is essentially a very difficult choice, did I make it. You never know what you're going to do in those circumstances, Valerie, until you're confronted. You either must do this or that. There are choices in life, Valerie, that either way you go are painful. I didn't like to do it, but I thought when I thought about it very carefully, I thought it was the better of two uh, mean alternatives. And with that in mind, I ask you, as I have asked myself, had you been there that night, what would you have done? Would you have stood and clapped? Would you have remained seated and silent? And if you think you know what you would have done, ask yourself, does it come with a cost? Okay. Okay, thank you all very much. I think I can just slip away. <laughs>